welcome to the international broadcast ministry of No Limits. I am Pastor Delman Coates and here at No Limits, we wanna help strengthen you, encourage you and empower you to feel God's love and to live your life without limitation. Today's message is about to begin and I wanna thank you for watching and know that I'm praying for you to hear a special word from God as you watch. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to Psalm 42. Psalm 42 is where our preaching emphasis will come from today. In your quiet moments, I really want to encourage you to read the entire psalm. But for the benefit of brevity and the sake of our subject, I, subject, I just want to read the first verse, which reads in the New International Version, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Amen. I want to preach today, church, from the thought, quench your thirst. Is that all right? Quench your thirst. And the life lesson for today's sermon in this year in which we are focused on pursuing the things of God through the theme, Divine Pursuits, we want to talk today about how do we renew our passion for the things of God. Quench your thirst. Thirst. I read a story years ago about a man named Tim Vanderveen who was in the hospital when a friend came to visit him. Tim had leukemia and his friend Dr. Brown asked how he was doing. And Tim responded, you know, I've learned that life is not like a VCR. To which his friend replied, I don't get it. What do you mean life is not like a VCR? Tim said, yeah, life is not like a VCR. You can't fast forward through the bad parts. Tim Church, Tim Vanderveen was right. Life doesn't give us the privilege of grabbing the remote control and bypassing the parts of life that we don't like. Instead, we have to live through them and persevere through the process, through the ups and the downs, the good times, and the bad times, you cannot fast forward through the bad parts. <clears throat> That's what the psalmist discovered in this 42nd Psalm. He is living through the bad parts of life. And scholars have debated precisely who is this, the author of this Psalm. Some think it was Absalom during the time when he was in rebellion against him, King David. Others suggest it was David himself during a time in his life after he had lost his wife, McCall, his place at the royal table, his position in the army, his freedom as a citizen, even his access to the temple had been taken away. David is now a fugitive uh, running from Saul. He's an enemy of the state. He has no family, no job, no money, no home, no country, and he can't even go to worship any longer. And then there are others who take the heading added to the top of this psalm by the editor at face value. They say this is a psalm written by the sons of a man named Korah, who was killed for rebelling against the Lord, but they are able to escape judgment. And the sons of Korah became worship leaders in the temple. But whoever the author, whether whether they were in rebellion or in exile or in mourning, it was written during a time of depression, discouragement, and great separation or distance from God. And there the writer talks about the way in which he longs, church, spiritually for the things of God. Psalm 42 is a, is a lament song, presumably written by someone who was formerly able to freely worship God in a gathered congregational setting. That's what I want you to understand. Whoever wrote it at the time of its composition, something had changed, however. The people found themselves dislocated from religious life, the sense of sacred community that they had previously enjoyed at one time in the past. There is no doubt about it that these are words coming from a community that missed worship as they knew it. Does that sound familiar? So the writer compares this sense of spiritual deficiency 
uh, 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 to something he has seen in the wild, to a deer being at a brook of, 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 a, of the river and, and the brook has dried up, the river has become bare, and he writes, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, my God. Apparently in the wild, he has come across such thirsty animals, tired and exhausted from the run. He has come across animals who had reached a point where they are in need of hydration and replenishment, but being unable to find it. And so the deer is at the brink, at the brook of the river that has dried up and is now panting. It conjures up the image of an animal that has been trying to evade capture, trying to escape seizure, and perhaps even trying to run away from death, and is now drained, is now depleted, and is now deprived of that which is essential for survival. Church, we can live without many things, but we cannot live without water. Our bodies use water to sweat and to eliminate toxins from the body. We have these sweat glands that are used to regulate the temperature of the body when we have been overly exerting ourselves, but without water. Uh, our senses cannot be regulated. Our cells cannot be hydrated. And ultimately, we cannot live without water. And so the psalmist compares this drained, desperate, and deficient deer in need of water to a person who longs to be spiritually filled by the things of God. As the deer pants, so my soul longs for you. Just like this deer, we too can become spiritually depleted of the things that we need in God. Just like this water, whether it was Absalom, David, or the praise leaders in the temple, we too can experience burnout. That is what the writer is suggesting. We can reach a point where the daily grind of all of the meetings, all of the responsibilities, the to and fro of going from work to church to kids' activities to checking emails to doing assignments to keeping up with family members, uh, watching the news, uh, trying to avoid COVID, paying bills, uh, trying to meet your spouse's needs, uh, and in the course of it all, trying to take care of yourself. It can cause you to feel burnout, amen? Uh, that is why the, that's where the psalmist is. He, he is at a point where he is in need of water but cannot find water. But he knows uh, that, that he cannot succumb to the desperation. He knows uh, that he cannot succumb to the burnout. He can't fall victim uh, to the sense of isolation that he feels. Uh, and the same way that the deer longs for water. So does he and so too should we long for the things of God. As the deer pants for, for water, for streams of water, so does my soul long for you, my God. That's his point. And as we embark on this a new year of divine pursuits, our aim should be to rekindle that spiritual flame, to reignite that fire that may have grown dull and grown dim during this pandemic. I'm talking to someone who over the course of, this two, of these two years of worshiping at home and trying to figure out your new normal, particularly when it, as it comes to being a Christian, many people have begun to spiritually wane and become weakened in their walk with God. And my prayer as the pastor is that we would be able to reboot our prayer lives to renew our study of the word of God and to take our worship to a new and a different level. That's what I want for this house. That's what I want for every believer and person connected with this house. And for that to happen, this text suggests that we've got to allow God to replenish our souls. See, when God created humankind, the Bible says that God breathed his breath 
his ruach in Hebrew, into the nostrils of Adam. And it was then that that flesh, that, 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 that mold of dirt became a living soul. Our soul is that part of us that according to classical Christian theology is made in the imago dei, the image of God. The 19th century mystic John of the cross said that God is awakened in the soul, that God breathes in the soul. The soul is the one thing that we possess that resembles God. And as such, the soul distinguishes us from all of the other creatures in the animal kingdom. The soul is that part of us where emotional feelings reside. It is that part of us that produces compassion and concern. It is that part of us that is moved when others are hurt or where we find ourselves in trouble. God God has ingeniously designed us with a soul. The soul is, in fact, the essence of who we really are, church. We are not physical beings that possess a soul. No, we are souls that possess a physical body. The soul houses the mind, the will, and the emo emotions. And it is in the soul, and it is with the soul that we love God, ourselves, and the world. But as central as the soul is, we cannot become spiritually disconnected from the source of our being whenever we go through challenges in life. We, 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 we can never get to a point where we lose our connection to God. We we look at the world and we become overwhelmed by everything that we are seeing in the world in transigence in Washington at a time when people need investment. Racism on the rise since Trump after we thought we had made so much progress after Obama. Police shootings of unarmed black men and women. It grieves the spirit. It grieves the soul and it makes us wonder what in the world is happening. We are inundated with with one bad report after another, the prior president did everything possible to undermine our democratic institutions, so much so that now we don't trust politicians, we don't trust one another, and we are languishing in this pandemic because we don't even trust science anymore. It weighs us down. And it doesn't seem as if things can get any better. Amen. <clears throat> but as the deer pants for streams of water, so should our souls long for the things of God. Amen. Just as the deer cannot live without water, we cannot live without the things of God. Have I got a witness here? And so... We must allow God to replenish our souls. Church, for a weary soul, prayer and praise, worship, and the word are what we need to reignite that spiritual flame whenever it is beginning to go out. Since the deer cannot live without water, the things of God are a part of the core curriculum of our faith. They are not the elective. Someone listening needs to hear me right now. Uh, we, someone in a season where you need to thirst, where you need to strive for the things of God in light of everything that you're going through, you are going to have to turn off the phone amen shut off the news uh, get off the sofa get off social media take a break from Netflix and online shopping and you're gonna have to get back <clears throat> excuse me into the face of God amen <clears throat> in this season when all hell is breaking loose it is our time now to get back into the presence of God the separation from God was messing with the psalmist in our text. Uh, he had been at a point where he was now in exile, and we must ask ourselves uh, whether we are positioning ourselves uh, to be replenished by and with the things of God. Is your circle adding to you or is it subtracting from you? Is your schedule nourishing you 
and nourishing your walk with God or is your schedule draining you? Uh, is your never ending to do list making your life better and simpler or is it stressing you out? The only way that you can replenish your soul, the only way that you can quench your thirst in the spirit for the things of God is to make time for the things of God. <laughs> See, the deer, need, the deer needs and longs for water, uh, not just for where he is now, but the deer needs water to give him the wherewithal to handle what's next. That's what I want to help someone understand. The reason we ought to hunger and thirst for the things of God is not just to make it through today, but to help us to make it through What's coming next? The psalmist had to deal with many things in this chapter. He has to deal with a sense of spiritual disconnect in verse 2. When verse 2 he says, when shall I come and behold the face of the Lord? He's wondering about when can he get back into the temple of God. He's got to deal with disconnect, but then he's got to deal with depression in verse 3a, he says, my tears have been may have been my food day and night. He's got to deal with disconnection and depression, but he's also got to deal with discouragement from others. In the B clause of verse 3, he says, while people say to me continually, where is your God? He had a, uh, he even had to deal not just with disconnection and depression and, and discouragement. The psalmist had to deal with doubt from within. He says there in verse 5a, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? The psalmist had to deal with people looking at his situation and causing him to doubt whether God was still there. And so... By replenishing his soul, he is able to handle the disconnect, the depression, the discouragement that comes from time to time. By replenishing his soul, he is able to handle the doubt as well. It is why David would rejoice later in Psalm 107.9 that he has satisfied my thirsty soul. It is why Jesus said in Matthew 5.6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. It's because there are some things coming up around the corner of your life that you can't even see yet, that you need to be prepared for now so that you can handle what is coming around the corner. That is why we need to hunger for the things of God. That is why we need to long for the things of God because there are some things coming up around the corner and you want to make sure that you are not depleted but you want to make sure that you are developed. You want to make sure that you are not drained but instead that you are energized. Look at what, look at what the psalmist had to deal with. He, he had to deal with discouragement and depression. He had to deal with doubt and he had to deal with disconnect from God. But by yearning for the things of God, he was able to be equipped for what was coming next. Our ancestors understood the relationship between spiritual connection and being equipped for battle. During the Montgomery bus boycott in Alabama that started on December the 5th, 1955 and lasted until December the 20th the following year, black folks in Montgomery, they didn't catch the bus to work. They either carpooled, but most of them walked every day to get to work. <clears throat> And as they walked, they sang songs and they prayed prayers to God. And while they walked to work, they were worshiping. I need y'all to get that here. While they were walking to work, they were worshiping at the same time. Well, story goes that one day a white reporter asked an elderly African-American lady if she was tired. And she said, sir, my feet is tired, but my soul is rested. I like that church because it tells us that when your soul is satisfied, you can handle any storm and you can weather any worship. I want to I wanna ask, is there anyone listening who can say like that mother, my feet is tired, 
but my soul is rested. I'm preaching this because I want to let someone know that you can't make it through this season if your soul is drained. You're not going to be able to make it through this season if your soul is depleted. You're not going to be able to make it through this season if your soul is weighed down. My feet is tired, but my soul is rested. That's why you've got to make up your mind. To get closer to God this year, I want to I wanna talk to someone who's allowed uh, the last 22 months to cause you uh, to become, to get further and further away from God. You're going to have to make up in your mind that you're going to draw nearer unto the Lord uh, so that regardless of what comes your way this year, you're going to have the inner wherewithal to weather it. You'll have the fortitude to survive it, and you'll be conditioned in your core to make it through. Is there anybody listening who will decide this year that I'm going to get closer in my walk with God? This notion. That as the deer pants for water, for streams of water, so my soul longs for you. It taps into the intense desire for God that all of us ought to have. Imagine a deer panting for water. Not just out of depletion, but, but out of desperation. Uh, we therefore should be likewise desperate for the divine. That's what, that's what the psalmist is trying to say. As the deer pants and yearns and longs for streams of water, uh, so too our, our soul ought to be desperate for the things of God. We ought to be so passionate in our spiritual pursuits that, that it is more than just an intellectual preoccupation. <laughs> It, it's, it is more than just something that is operative in our mind. It is something that in our very being we understand that we cannot do without the, the presence of God in our lives. How's your thirst? How would you characterize your thirst for God? Are, are you on fire for the things of God this year? <laughs> Or is your pursuit lackluster as best? It is until, it is not until we shift in our desire to be connected to a deeper insight and a relationship with God that we will find fulfillment and when we will quench that yearning in our soul. Tragedy is that the world leads us to pursue everything but that which really matters. The world leads us to pursue cash and cars, and clothes and houses and land. The world moves us to pursue titles and position and prestige and worldly relationships. And none of these things are in and of themselves bad. But I've discovered that material things may gratify your flesh, but they'll never satisfy your soul. Have I got a witness that somebody's got to have a car? You've gotten a house. You've gotten the relationship you desired. And that while it gratified you in the moment, it did not satisfy your deepest longings. This led Jesus to ask in Mark 8, what does it profit a person to gain the world? To get the bag, to get the shoes, to get the car, to get the money, the wealth, if they lose their what? their soul. The other day I was going to do some work at a cafe and when I got to the cafe I had my laptop, my phone and my iPad. The problem was there was just only one plug or outlet available at the cafe. <laughs> I needed to charge all three, my laptop, my phone and my iPad but, but there was only one plug. So what I did was I I plugged my laptop into the main outlet. And since my, since my laptop had two inputs on it, I was able to then charge my phone and my iPad by plugging them into my computer. I need y'all to get this. Now, while all three of them are being charged, the phone and the iPad would be foolish to praise the laptop for giving them the power. Because the power wasn't coming from the laptop. Uh, the laptop is not the source, it's merely the conduit. The laptop is relying on something greater. 
And likewise, when we obtain worldly things, whether degrees or status or success, we cannot give credit to those things because those things are plugged into and are the result of something greater, and that is our relationship with God. Listen to me, church. Don't you give the credit for where you are and who you are and what you have to the wrong things? You better give that credit to God. Have I got a witness here? That is why in this season we should yearn for the things of God because everything that we do and everything that we have and everything that we are is because of something greater. Come on, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm plugged into the source. Come on, type in the chat room. I'm plugged into the, is there anybody listening today who can testify that I'm here today because I'm plugged into something greater? Psalmist. Psalmist goes on to suggest that if we are to satisfy this desire, this yearning in our soul, if we are to quench this spiritual thirst, then we must make a conscious, intentional decision to grow spiritually. Yeah, you're going to have to grow spiritually this year. I, I, I've discovered, church, that spiritual growth doesn't come by divine osmosis. Uh, you don't grow in your prayer life by being haphazard and casual with your prayer life. You don't, you don't grow stronger in your faith by reading the Bible only when you hear a sermon, whatever that is. <clears throat> you're not going to grow by being casual in your walk with God. No, you're only going to get stronger when you are intentional, when, when you make an intentional decision to get closer in your walk with God. And to do that, I want to suggest to you today that when we think about how a deer drinks water, we discover that there are two things that are required to quench your spiritual thirst. First of all, in order to quench that thirst, you've got to stop running. <laughs> Come on, tell your neighbor, stop running. Uh, many people are so busy doing them and doing themselves uh, that they don't take the time uh, to give priority to their spiritual lives. I, just, I note that because no deer drinks on the run. Have you seen a deer drink water on the run? <laughs> no. In order for that deer to drink and to be replenished, the deer has to stop running. And I want to tell someone who's been running from the things of God that God wants me to tell you that if you want to get closer in your walk with God, you're going to have to stop running. You, you need to pull over to the side of the road. You need to press the pause button or just to do stop doing whatever you've been doing so that you can take some time to be with God. Let me see if I can make this plain. Parker Palmer was the founder and senior partner of the Center for Courage and Renewal in Chicago. Parker Palmer wrote a transformative book entitled Let Your Life Speak. And in it, he shares a short story about discovery and devotion. And he states that if a person wanted to go off into the woods and to somehow encounter wild game, the last thing that one would do would be to rush into the forest and to aggressively start going through the trees and the bushes looking for wild game. Instead, he said, if you're going looking for wild game, if you really want to experience wildlife, the best approach is to find a quiet spot beneath a strong tree and to just take a seat and sit quietly. And he writes that before long, by just being still and being quiet, the very thing that you're looking for will find its way to you. That's how it is with God. That's how it is with God, a child of God. As long as we are going to and fro about the hustle and bustle of the day, we just might miss the word, the revelation, the insight, and the things that God has for us. But if we stop and pause what we are doing and quiet ourselves and the noise around us, then and just then we might hear and receive the things that God wants us to get. 
There is an unconscious and an unsatisfied longing after God that we all should have. No man is made to be satisfied in and of him or herself. No individual carries within him or herself the foundation from which we can draw. We are not self-made individuals. We are God-made individuals. And if a heart is to be blessed, it's got to step out of the narrow circle of our own individuality if a person's life is to be strong and happy we must get the foundation of this strength not from ourselves but by longing for the things of God listen to me child of God you have got to reach a point where you understand that everything you are and everything you have is totally dependent upon God have I got a witness here I have reached a point where I have discovered that I cannot be the pastor, the man, the son, the father, the leader that God wants me to be without relying on the things of God. I don't have it within myself. I don't have the right knowledge, the right insight, the right revelation and everything I am. It, ha- it comes from God. As a deer panthers for streams of water. So my soul longs for you. It is why Jesus said, he that believeth on him shall never hunger, and he that cometh to him shall never thirst again. Stop running. Tell your neighbor, stop running. But after you stop running, you got to bow down. The deer must stop in order to drink water, but they don't drink standing upright. I was thinking about that. In order to quench their thirst, the the deer, after they stop, they have to bow their heads. They have to position themselves in order to obtain the water that they need and desire. This, my friends, is a picture of the posture of worship and prayer. You cannot grow without making worship and prayer a priority in your life. You got to stop running, but then you got to bow down. This is why worship and prayer are so central in the word of God. It is why they are are the lifeblood of our faith. If you want to go grow in your walk with God, prayer and worship are the fuel that propel us in life. You got to stop running, but you got to bow down. And what I like about the psalmist is that he seems to get it now. He seems to understand as you read this chapter uh, that spiritual replenishment does not exempt us from the challenges that come our way. (laughs) He understands that the role of the spiritual replenishment is to not exempt us from trouble but to strengthen us in trouble. I I saw something in the psalm that jumped out of the page at me. It says there in verses 5 and 11, that after talking about the way in which his soul was cast down, the psalmist goes on to declare his praises to God. Twice, in verse 5 and in verse 11, the psalmist says the same thing. Why are you cast down, soul? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted in me? But he doesn't stop there. Somebody say he doesn't stop there. He says, hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my help and my God. That made me shout (laughs) that in the midst of depression, in the midst of discouragement, in the middle of disconnection and in the middle of doubt, the twice, the psalmist says that I will praise God again, which helps us to understand that every now and then you got to give a pep talk to your soul. Have I got a witness here? There are times uh, when you got to learn how to encourage the spirit man on the inside of you to take control of the natural man because the natural man wants to succumb to discouragement. The natural man wants to succumb to doubt. The natural man wants to succumb to depression. But every now and then, you got to learn how to encourage yourself. Psalmist starts to encourage his soul. He gives a pep talk 
to his soul. That's what the psalmist is doing. Uh, he's feeling disconnected. He's dealing with depression and dealing with doubt, but he still finds a way to encourage himself. I'm talking to someone listening uh, who's got more month at the end of your money. I, I'm talking to someone else who's got a court date that is imminent. And God says, you got to learn how to encourage yourself. He says, I will yet praise him. That's what I like. Come on, he says, I will yet praise him. Some of you need to give God a yet praise. What's a yet praise? A yet praise is I'm going through preacher, but I'm going to give God praise anyhow. A times a heart. But I will yet thank him. The psalmist says, I'm dealing with depression. My soul is weighed down. And my soul is disquieted. But I will yet praise God. Have I got a witness here? And I stopped by to tell somebody that every now and then, you got to learn how to give God a yet praise. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody listening? Going through a storm, but you got to yet praise. Your money is funny. Your change is strange, but you got to praise on your lips. Have I got a witness? A yet praise says that God may not deliver you from it, but God can deliver you in it. A yet praise is not thanking him for it, but thanking him in it. Have I got a witness? Is there anybody listening who can thank God for a yet praise, a yet shout, a yet dance? Have I got a witness? I'm broke. But I'm going to praise it. Relationship on the rocks. But I'm still going to thank him. Surgery this week. But I'm still going to give God a yet praise. A yet shout. A yet hallelujah. Come on, give him a yet praise. Right at home. Right at work. Him. I yet praise. Come on, put your hands together and give him praise. The psalmist says, I got to quench my thirst because I need God to fill me and prepare me for what's coming up around the corner. I want to encourage you and let you know that in this season, you have got to make a decision to get closer in your walk with God. Because something is coming up around the corner, disconnection, depression, discouragement, and doubt. And you want to make sure that you are prepared for what's coming next. And in two verses, verses 5 and 11, the psalmist says, uh, my soul, why are you cast down? <clears throat> And why are you disquieted? But yet, I will still praise the Lord. I want to tell someone listening, you got to get you a yet praise. Get you a yet thanks, giving to God. You know, we praise God, not for it, but in it. And I want to encourage you to renew your walk with God to revive, restore, re reinvigorate, reignite, and to renew your walk with God so that you can be prepared and equipped for what's coming next. Amen and amen. No Limits was created to help you strengthen your relationship with Jesus and to help you explore the limitless possibilities for your life. Connect with me today through our website at delmancoats.org. There you will find free resources available for immediate download with no obligation whatsoever. I begin each day thanking God for you and those like you who watch and support this ministry. It is truly a blessing to serve you. Once again, you can find us at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And remember to live your life each day with no limits.
I want to invite you to join me on an incredible journey through the ancestral trail of African heritage as we visit Ghana in the fall of 2022. Located in the heart of West Africa, Ghana is known for its lush forests, diverse animal life, and miles of sandy beaches along with its rich history. Join me as we pay homage to key figures in Black history, enjoy a traditional African naming ceremony, and visit a wonderful museum dedicated to the Ashanti Kingdom. You can learn more about this trip on my website at delmancoats.org. But don't delay in signing up as space is very limited. Thank you for watching today's message and I look forward to traveling with you to Ghana next fall. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org and look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of No Limits and Mount Enon Baptist Church in Clinton, Maryland.